Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. We're staring at another zero year. Lockdowns, restrictions, virus surge, deaths, it's playing out all over again, perhaps worse than the last time. The cases are shooting up way too fast. The virus has mutated thousands of times. Some strains are proving to be especially challenging. But have we learned any lessons? The world is still fighting. Now over vaccines, there's a shortage. Countries like India that were exporting to the whole world have imposed an export ban because the supply has to be secured at home first. Countries in the West, the so-called developed ones, never bothered to share any shots with the world. They've been busy inoculating their own people first and hoarding vaccines and it hasn't helped them, by the way. A few side effects and they disrupt the rollout. Governments are succumbing to public hysteria. It's a picture of chaos. And amid all this fighting and confusion, one country is gaining, China. It is emerging as the biggest exporter of vaccines, unproven vaccines, that desperate countries are lapping up. On Gravitas tonight, we'll tell you how with this surge, the world is playing into the hands of Beijing all over again. Also on the show, the Myanmar coup is playing out in London. The Burmese ambassador is locked out of the embassy by his staff. Britain's response? hypocrisy and political correctness. And here's the other side of the spectrum, Turkey's Erdogan, the opposite of politically correct. Two presidents visited his country. He had a chair only for the man. Do you wonder why things do not last anymore? You know, things like phones, clothes, toys, appliances. It's a business model. They're built to fail, we'll explain. And Italy has abolished film censorship. Why is it a big deal? Do censors even make sense in the age of the internet? And do they work? We'll discuss that, but we begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. A group of international scientists and researchers from Europe, the US, Australia and Japan say in an open letter that the joint China World Health Organization study into COVID-19 was tainted by politics and more rigorous investigations are required with or without Beijing. Twelve people were found beheaded following an ISIS-claimed attack on the northern Mozambique town of Palma, near natural gas projects worth billions. Local police commissioner told local media that all those beheaded were most likely foreigners, as they were white. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern temporarily suspends entry for all travelers from India, including its own citizens, following a surge of positive coronavirus cases on arrival. The suspension will start from 11th and will be in place until April 28th. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has said that the nation will scrap exemptions for judges and politicians from sexual harassment laws as his government struggles to contain a backlash over allegations of mistreatment of female lawmakers and staff. The United States has warned China against what the Philippines and Taiwan see as increasingly aggressive moves, reminds Beijing of Washington's obligations to its partners. Paeng Takhon, a 24-year-old leading Myanmar actor, singer and model who has backed the country's anti-coup protests, was arrested on Thursday as the junta hunts more than 100 celebrities for supporting the movement in its bloody crackdown on dissent since the February 1st coup. We plan to restart the U.S. economic 
U.S. economic, development, security, and humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people. Reversing Donald Trump's decision to block all aid to Palestine, the United States has announced a contribution of 235 million U.S. dollars of aid to Palestinians. Two-thirds will go to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees, which suffered a financial crisis since Trump cut funding in 2018. A port city in eastern China has launched an ambitious plan to build the country's fifth rocket launch site under a longer-term goal to ramp up space infrastructure to meet the demands of an expected boom in commercial missions. Paris Saint-Germain have handed Bayern Munich their first Champions League defeat in over two years. Kylian Mbappé and Marquinhos put the visitors 2-0 up in the quarter-final first leg in Munich. But defending champions Bayern fought back level via goals from Eric Maxime Chupomoting and Thomas Müller. However, Mbappé came up with a stunning finish in the 68th minute for a second of the night to give PSG a 3-2 win. This year's French Open has been postponed by a week due to the COVID pandemic and will now begin on May 30th. Organizers said the decision had been taken with the hope that more fans will be permitted to attend the Clay Court Grand Slam in Paris. France is in a third nationwide lockdown amid a surge in coronavirus cases, but it is expected that restrictions will be eased by the 1st of June. Last year the tournament had to be pushed back by four months. More than 126,000. That's the number of new infections recorded in India in the last 24 hours. 126,000 plus. It's the highest single day spike for the country and the worst may be yet to come. For the world, for the whole world in fact, the numbers do not look good. In the last seven days, more than 500,000 people tested positive every day. 500,000 every day. That's the average. Brazil and India are the new hotspots, the worst hit. What is causing this spike? Two factors. Number one is the variants. The mutating virus is driving the surge. And number two is the vaccines. There is a massive global shortage of vaccines. Countries are banning exports because they need to secure supplies at home first. If I have to describe the pandemic response right now in one word, I'd say it's a mess, absolute chaos. And thanks to this chaos, one country is emerging the winner. The country is China. I will explain. How is China winning? The virus surge and the vaccine shortage is making the world desperate. So it is buying China's unproven vaccines by the millions. And as if overnight, China has become the biggest producer and exporter of Wuhan virus vaccines. On Gravitas tonight, we'll tell you how China is winning from the global pandemic disorder. But first, let's talk to you about the surge. The virus is no longer the same. It is mutating. You know that. It is taking many new forms. We call them variants. Now, some of these variants are more infectious. The Wuhan virus has mutated more than 12,000 times, and this is as of November 2020. More than 12,000 mutations. Most of these mutations are unremarkable. But some are serious. Experts are tracking four mutations. The first one is called the Brazil variant. Scientists call this the P1. It was first identified in the Amazonian city of Manaus in December 2020. Now it is the dominant strain in Brazil. What can this variant do? Can it make you more unwell? There is no evidence of that, but it does spread faster. And that ultimately means more deaths because more people are getting infected. Just today, Brazil recorded more than 4,000 Wuhan virus deaths in one day, 4,000 deaths. This was the deadliest 24 hours of the pandemic in Brazil. The next variant is the UK variant. You must have heard about this one. Scientists call it the B117. And like the name suggests, it was first detected in the UK. It was found in September last year, and at that time it was seen in just one out of four patients. But by December, almost two thirds of the new cases in London were of this new strain. So countries started imposing travel bans on the UK, but that did not stop the spread. Now the variant is found on all major continents, the UK variant. 
Then we have the South Africa variant, and this too has spread to a number of countries. Experts believe vaccines are less effective against the South Africa strain. The fourth one is called the double mutant. And this variant was found in India recently in samples tested from Maharashtra, Delhi and Punjab. Why is it called the double mutant? Because this variant carries two mutations, two different kinds of Wuhan virus strains in one virus. The double mutant. This could allow the virus to evade your body's immune system. It could be resistant to antibodies. So even those who have recovered might catch the Wuhan virus again. And that could also mean weaker immunity for existing vaccines. So there are four serious mutations of the virus and all four types have been found in India. Is that why the cases are shooting up? Well, we cannot say for sure. That's because Indian authorities are reportedly not testing enough for newer strains. According to a report, India has tested less than 1% of its positive samples for variants. In comparison, the UK has sequenced 8% of infections and 33% in just the last week. So we simply do not know how the new strains are behaving in India. What about the vaccines? Do vaccines work against these new strains? Well, they do. That's what experts maintain so far. But the world does not have enough of them. Last week, the European Union decided to curb vaccine exports for six weeks. Yesterday, Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison complained about supply shortages from Europe. That 3.1 million of the contracted vaccines that we had been relying upon in early January when we'd set out a series of targets did not turn up in Australia. That is just a simple fact. Now, that fact has been the key reason um, for the early phases of the supply shortage in the rollout of the vaccine. It's, it's straightforward maths. 3.1 million out of 3.8 million doses did not come to Australia. In the US, there is a shortage of the Johnson & Johnson shot. Several cities are bracing for a supply disruption. Same with the United Kingdom. It has begun using the Moderna vaccine now. That's because the rollout of other shots has dropped to the lowest level this year. There's a supply crunch at AstraZeneca. It has been caused by manufacturing problems in the company, which brings me back to India. AstraZeneca had struck a deal with India's Serum Institute to make the Oxford vaccine here. The Oxford vaccine is what we call the Covid shield in India. So AstraZeneca was relying on the Serum Institute for supplies. But now it has sent a legal notice to the Indian partner. AstraZeneca is blaming the Serum Institute for supply delays. Also complaining of supply delays are some Indian states. They say the AstraZeneca vaccine or Covishield is not available in enough quantities for them. It is one of the two vaccines approved for use in India, the Covishield and Covaxin. The Covishield is being used on a much larger scale. The government of India has already placed a temporary hold on all exports of the vaccine. It says complaints of shortages in India are unfounded. The Health Minister of India shared these figures today. He says there are enough vaccines to go around in India. For the rest of the world, though, the shortage is serious. Do you know who benefits from the shortage? China does. It knows that governments are desperate and they will lap up vaccines even if the efficacy is questionable. And that's exactly what is happening. Reports say 70 countries, 7-0, and territories have either approved Chinese shots or struck deals to secure them. Beijing has even donated shots to 37 countries. China has produced 230 million doses of unproven vaccines. By March, it had exported more than 100 million of these shots. In comparison, India has exported 63 million doses to 84 countries and the European Union has exported 58 million doses. What about the rest of the developed world? Well, they don't believe in sharing. They're busy inoculating their own citizens first. The result is this. China, with unproven shots, is leading the exports of Wuhan virus vaccines and the rest of the world is fighting over doses. Well done, we say. And the fight over vaccines stems from one question. Who should be given priority? Earlier, it was thought that the elderly would be the most affected section by the Wuhan virus. So they were placed in high priority lists for the vaccines. Well, that model left younger generations with comorbidity without vaccines. 
Health workers had to be kept safe, so they too were inoculated first. That model left vaccinated health workers treating patients infected with mutated viruses. And that may not be susceptible to the vaccine. It also left millions of students still counting days to return to school. So we are back to the question, who should be given priority for vaccines and who qualifies as an essential worker? In 1869, when Charles Darwin wrote about the survival of the fittest, he was referring to the mechanism of natural selection. When nature gets to pick, who makes the cut to the next generation? Little did the British naturalists know that 125 years later, our world would evolve to a point where men would pick who survives. The year is 2021. The last 12 months were spent developing a vaccine for the Wuhan virus. The dilemma now is to pick who gets these life-saving jabs first. Who makes it to the priority list? You would think the answer is simple. Essential workers first, the elderly next, and then the rest of the crowd. Trust us when we say this model is not working. Try and answer this question. Who is an essential worker? And what qualifies as essential? For Japan, the upcoming Olympics are essential. It has been postponed once. A repeat would tantamount to losses worth billions. So it wasn't surprising when reports claimed Japan was planning to vaccinate Olympic athletes first. These men and women, after all, are Japan's essential workers right now. The not-so-essential Japanese began protesting online. Why not the elderly first? One of the comments on social media in response to this news of athletes potentially being prioritized was, is it the Olympics over life now? No, says the government of Japan, denying reports of prioritization of athletes. Say Japan does indeed vaccinate the elderly first. How would that be fair on someone who is 20 and fighting cancer? In the CDC vaccine rollout recommendation, People above 16 and with comorbidity only feature in the third step of the inoculation program. While this template is for American states, something very similar is being followed the world over. As a result, youngsters with life-threatening illnesses are being denied vaccines. Is this fair? Vacina Ja is Portuguese for vaccine now. The National Museum of Brazil is beaming the country's demand. On the 6th of April, Brazil recorded 4,195 daily deaths. It's worst on record. But only health workers, people above 75, residents of old age homes and Brazil's indigenous population are currently eligible for vaccination. The new wave has shown this order of prioritization does not work. When the virus does not discriminate, why should vaccines? Be it on the basis of age or profession. It is critical that health workers are safe. It is also essential that our children return to school. Workers return to factories and farmers to their farms. Brazil's protest against President Bolsonaro's handling of the pandemic has touched a tipping point. Bolsonaro has asked the military if they have troops to quell possible unrest. Is it only a matter of time before the frustration breaches borders? How long will the world silently wait for life-saving vaccines? How long will people with threatening illnesses put up with this injustice? Like we told you, it's not easy to decide who gets priority. The answer becomes all the more difficult when you account for the fact that it may be weeks or even months before the next batch of vaccines reaches your country. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. From masks to lockdowns to vaccines and now to the side effects, the conversation around the Wuhan virus keeps evolving. The big debate now is about side effects. How serious are they? Do the benefits still outweigh the risks? 
The answer may depend on where you live. We are having this conversation because of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Multiple reports have linked it to blood clots. The European regulator has confirmed this. Blood clots have been listed as a rare side effect of the AstraZeneca vaccine. What about the EU member states? Well, they're free to decide for themselves. Continue to roll the rollout or stop it. So much for a pan-European regulator. Well, here's the thing. The AstraZeneca vaccine is still humanity's best bet against the virus. It is cheap, it is easy to store, and it is easy to transport. Yes, there could be a casual link between clots and the vaccine, but the benefits still outweigh the risks. And if it's a toss-up between a blood clot and the Wuhan virus, the expert opinion is very clear. The virus is much deadlier. The risk of infection is much more potent. Take the vaccine. But it doesn't take much for the world to panic nowadays. And after last year, it is difficult not to. This is a key moment in our fight against the Wuhan virus. Vaccines are already in short supply. Some countries are yet to get shipments. A global wave of vaccine hesitancy is the last thing we need. So how do we navigate this? The World Health Organization has a huge role to play if it wants to. And it hasn't exactly covered itself in glory during this pandemic. But here is a shot at redemption. The WHO says the blood clot link is plausible, but not confirmed. So there's still a question mark. An expert committee is going to meet next week to review the data. If the WHO makes the right noises, there is still hope for AstraZeneca. Because right now, countries are pandering to the hysteria. Italy has limited the vaccine to people above 60 years. Britain is offering alternative jabs to those below 30, so you can get a Pfizer or Moderna shot instead of AstraZeneca. In the UK, this is the first time that Britain has wavered on the vaccine and its efficacy. In Spain, the jab will be available only for 60-plus people. But across the Atlantic, in Latin America, both Mexico and Brazil plan to stick with the current policy. Australia and the Philippines are also imposing limits. People below 50 can get the AstraZeneca jab in Australia and in the Philippines, the limit is 60 years. The bottom line is this. There is no universal policy on the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's every nation for itself. But what about other vaccines in the market? Are they foolproof? Let me tell you this. Side effects are universal. All medicines trigger unwanted reactions, some more than others. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are no different. These are the common side effects listed under the US CDC, Center for Disease Control. Tiredness, headache, muscle pain, chills, fever, nausea. And some of these cases were serious. In the US, the first few weeks saw multiple cases of severe allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis. In rare cases, this can cause your windpipe to swell up, cutting off your oxygen supply. It's a life-threatening condition. Pfizer and Moderna are yet to be subjected to AstraZeneca's level of scrutiny, but that could change in the coming weeks. Because the U.S. has launched a new clinical trial. It targets Moderna and Pfizer. 3,400 adults will be part of this trial. We should have the results by the end of the summer. But here is the catch. America would have administered millions of doses by the time these results are out. So in effect, this is a retrospective study. Here's another question. Why the sudden furor over side effects? They've existed as long as medicine itself. In most cases, society ignores them, looking at the greater good. The most striking, striking example is the birth control pill. Do you know what the side effects of the birth control pill are? Weight gain, depression, mood swings, and yes, blood clots. So where is Britain's alternative for the birth control pill? Will Australia, Italy and others ban their use? Unlikely. The conversation around AstraZeneca must be rooted in science. Governments must listen to scientists and not be overwhelmed by public hysteria. The Myanmar military's power grab has reached the British capital. Myanmar's envoy to Britain made anti-coup statements. His staff locked him out of the embassy building in London, he ended up spending the night inside his car. It was a tricky situation for London. Should it stand with the ousted envoy or back the decision of the coup leaders? Our next report tells you what the UK did. It's the dead of night in London. 
With the Wuhan virus on the prowl, most residents have called it a day. But outside the Myanmar embassy, something's brewing. There are cops stationed at the door. Journalists are clicking away. At the center of it all is this man, Kyo Tsuar Min, Myanmar's ambassador to Britain. Former ambassador, should we say? Because his staff has taken over the embassy. The ambassador has been locked out. This is kind of cool, okay. Thank you. Who is in the building? Um, uh, defense uh, attache. They occupy my embassy, okay. Kiev Swarmin is a critic of the junta. He wants the elected government reinstated. So the junta fired him. Military allied diplomats at the embassy rebelled. They were led by Chit Win, the defense attache. As soon as Min left the embassy, they locked up. And when he returned, the door was bolted shut. Not one to be denied, Min stood rooted outside the door. He refused to leave and ended up spending the night in his car. By the next morning, news had spread. A crowd of anti-coup protesters gathered outside the embassy. They were keen to hear from the ambassador himself. Instead, a member of the local Burmese community read out this statement. We have full faith in the UK government not to recognize the military council of Myanmar and not to follow the military council request to install Dr. Che Win as the Chengdi uh, affair, but to stand with the democratically elected government of Myanmar and its people. As it turned out, Britain blinked. They accepted the junta's decision. Kiev Swarmin ceased to be Myanmar's ambassador. London says it had to respect diplomatic traditions and norms. They are laid out clearly in the Vienna Convention. Evicting the hold-up diplomats would have sent the wrong signal. Instead, Britain opted for hypocrisy. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab condemned the embassy's takeover. He lauded Min's courage and ended his statement with a call to end the coup. Confusing, to say the least. Why is London taking orders from a government it has sanctioned? The embassy coup shows how delicate the situation is. World powers could storm the gates of Myanmar and topple the regime. But that's not how it works. As the ousted ambassador himself said, diplomacy is the only response to the current impasse. But time is running out. Close to 600 people have died in Myanmar. Thousands have been rounded up and packed into jails. International rules forced London to strip the ambassador. But there is scope for redemption. Could Britain recognize Min as the envoy of the parallel government? It's a delicate balance that the world must strike. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. Turkey makes it a point to stay in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. The latest is a diplomatic blunder. And if I had to sum it up in one line, I would say two presidents were on an official visit to Turkey. Only the man was offered a chair. The images from the diplomatic disaster are too interesting and the mess too grave just to finish the story in a line. So here's what we'll do. We'll start with a video from the official visit and what's being called the quote-unquote sofa gate. This is European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen entering a meeting room in Ankara in Turkey along with Charles Michel. He is the European Council President. Also present is the President of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Watch what happens next. Let's replay 
Von der Leyen's reaction. That's the European Commission president wondering why there isn't a chair for her. Now, diplomatically, her rank is at par with the two men. Diplomatic protocol dictates a chair for her as well, as does courtesy. But Turkey seems to know none. President von der Leyen was left standing. Kind Turkey arranged a sofa for her, one that was kept at a distance from the male presidents and opposite the Turkish foreign minister, whose diplomatic rank, by the way, is far below von der Leyen. What was Turkey thinking? In every meeting, every visit, whether we are visiting or visitors come to Turkey, those in charge of protocol get together and discuss arrangements. In this discussion, the protocol that was applied during the narrow scope meeting was held in our president's office, met the requests made by the EU. In other words, such a seating arrangement was made in line with suggestions by the EU, period. Protokol e, birimlerimiz önceden bir araya geldi ve onların telkinleri ve talepleri karşılanmıştır. Teşekkür ediyorum. We've not been able to verify that. And why would the European Union have Turkey snub the president? The blame game does not help, given Turkey and the EU are trying to mend ties. Turkey's male chauvinism slash sexism is on display, and it comes on the heels of Turkey withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention. What's that about? Combating gender-based violence. Ironically well-timed, wouldn't you say? Turkey does not agree, though. There are extremely unfair accusations against Turkey, both within the framework of what importance we give to women and other areas. Turkey is not hosting a guest for the first time. This isn't the first time a visit is being made to Turkey. Turkey is not hosting a guest for the first time. And that's exactly why it should have known better. You know what's amusing? All the previous times when there were three presidents in a room, three male presidents in a room, Turkey somehow got the protocol right. And we have proof when we say this. Let me show you a video from 2015. There was a similar meeting between the EU and Turkey. It was being held at Antalya. There were three leaders in attendance, Turkish President Erdogan, European Council President Donald Tusk, and then European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, all men. Look how Turkey got the sitting arrangement just right. So what went wrong this time? Perhaps Turkey is taking lessons on diplomatic protocol from its dear friend Pakistan. Remember how Prime Minister Imran Khan snubbed Saudi Arabia's King Salman at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation Summit. Here's a quick recap. You saw what happened. He left without the Saudi king getting a chance to respond to what he'd said. This video is from 2019. We do hope Imran Khan has learned some of the courtesy that his position demands in the last two years. As for Turkey, it seems to have forgotten it all. What's worse, Turkey is totally unapologetic about it. Let's turn our attention to Northern Ireland. Sectarian tensions there have taken a violent turn. The region is witnessing its worst rioting in years. The police was targeted with petrol bombs. Children as young as 12 years of age are involved in these clashes. What triggered the rioting? Our next report has some answers. It began last week. More than 30 petrol bombs were thrown at the police in Northern Ireland. In Belfast, one of the protesters targeted this van, while a police officer was still inside. On Wednesday, the violence escalated. Crowds of youth hijacked this bus and set it on fire. Later in the evening, cars were set on fire. 
For six nights now, parts of Northern Ireland have been witnessing this violence. The reason is Brexit. The United Kingdom's deal with the European Union puts Northern Ireland in a spot. It is legally a part of the UK, but it still falls inside the European Union customs regime, allowing it access to the European single market. The arrangement has led to some disruptions in the delivery of food supplies, plants and online delivery. The loyalists are angry. They want Northern Ireland to remain a part of the UK, but they believe the post-Brexit arrangement has cut off the region from the rest of the UK. That discontent has now exploded. The First Minister of Northern Ireland has appealed for calm. The scenes we have seen over this last evening and in previous evenings in various parts of Northern Ireland are, are totally unacceptable. There can be no place in our society for violence or the threat of violence and it must stop. Just as it was wrong in the past and was never justified, so it is wrong now and cannot be justified. The injury to frontline officers, victims terrorised, damage to people's property, the harm to Northern Ireland's image in this our centenary year has taken us backwards. And no brick, no bottle, no petrol bomb thrown has achieved or can ever achieve anything but destruction, harm and fear. Prime Minister. Uh, well, actually, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is deeply concerned about the violence, but the pro-unionists seem to have given up on politicians. Reports say sinister elements are exploiting the youth. Angry teenagers have been attacking the police. For years, the population of Northern Ireland has been divided in two. The Unionists, who are loyal to the UK, and the Nationalists, who want Northern Ireland to be independent. The 1998 Good Friday Agreement, better known as the Belfast Deal, has ended three decades of violence between the two groups. But Brexit has rocked the fragile peace. While the United Kingdom still remains in the grip of the pandemic, for Boris Johnson, the rioting on the streets of Northern Ireland represents a ticking time bomb. Bureau Report, we on. World is one. Do you think movies should be censored? Italy has abolished film censorship. All films. Going forward, the state will not have any power when it comes to censoring scenes from a movie, any kind of movie, or banning a film on moral, religious or political grounds. Film distributors will have the power to classify their own films under various age brackets. Is this the way forward for the rest of the world too? And should more countries follow suit? Take a look at our next report and do tell us what you think about this. Is it possible to really ban a film these days? In the age of live streaming, piracy and social media, people find one way or another to watch what they want to. Censorship has become pretty pointless. Cut out a scene from a movie and before you realize, the uncut version surfaces online. The more you assault a movie, the more popular it becomes. Italy seems to have realized this. It has ended censorship of films on moral and religious grounds. Till date, the country has modified at least 10,000 films. 130 Hollywood movies have been censored. So have 274 Italian films and 321 international movies. Bernardo Bertolucci's The Last Tango in Paris was not spared either. The film was nominated for Oscar, but when it came to Italian morality, it did not make the cut. Italy is not the only country guilty of censoring movies. In 2012, China censored Titanic 3D, referring to Kate Winslet's nude body. A Chinese official said, considering the vivid 3D effects, we fear that viewers may reach out their hands for a touch and thus interrupt other people's viewing. 
Really? China also pulled down James Cameron's avatar two weeks after it was premiered. The plight of the Navi was too similar to the plight of Chinese locals <laughs> who were fighting the government to protect their property. Did you know in Myanmar films are censored if the actors are in tight pants? To create some movie magic. The 2017 release Beauty and the Beast was apparently too gay for the Malaysian audience. So certain scenes from the animated hit were clipped. Nobody deserves it. In India, the shadow of colonial censorship laws still looms. 50 years ago, the Apex Court of India said continual exposure to films of a similar character would significantly affect the attitude of an individual or a group. While that may be true even today, don't social media and primetime news debates also affect an individual's attitude? Films are no longer the sole medium of entertainment. Neither are they our only window to the world. Yet almost every country wastes time vetting and censoring them. In this day and age, it's best to let the viewers decide. Bureau report, we on World is One. Self-sabotage does not rank high as a company policy, unless you're Apple Inc., in which case throttling your devices is a sales tactic. Think about it. Apple seems to have a new phone out all the time. But who is upgrading so fast? More importantly, why are they upgrading so fast? Turns out this is the new norm of business. Apple is not the only guilty party here, but it makes for a great example. So let me begin by telling you about Apple's latest lawsuit. It was filed in Chile. Apple has agreed to pay Chilean customers $3.4 million. What for? This is where the story gets interesting. Listen carefully. Apple programmed its phones to have a limited lifespan. The idea is to reduce durability so that phones slow down or conk off and customers come back to buy new ones. Sounds shrewd, right? Well, it's also illegal. 150,000 users in Chile complained of underperformance. It was mostly reported in Model 6 Plus and later. But how did Apple manage to sabotage its own phones? With a software upgrade. In 2017, most of these users received a software upgrade. Like all normal people, they downloaded it. But from that point on, the phone slowed down. In the tech world, this is called planned obsolescence. And this is not a theory. Apple has admitted to doing this as far back as in 2017. 30 American states sued Apple for slowing their phones. Last year, the company paid a total of $613 million in compensation. In France, it paid $25 million. In Italy, $10 million. This isn't some software upgrade gone wrong. It's a planned strategy to make you, the customer, keep buying more. And these are not civil lawsuits. Planned obsolescence is a criminal charge, but companies continue to use it. In fact, they have perfected it. Look at the manufacturer's warranty on your products. It might say one year or two or five years based on what you're looking at. In reality, this is not the warranty period. This is the lifespan. Because the moment the warranty runs out, the product malfunctions. Coincidence much? The fact is, this is all choreographed. Most products are designed to fail after the warranty period. So we, the customers, go back to the shops again and again. It's a foolproof business model. But as I said earlier, it's also illegal. Planned obsolescence cuts at the root of sustainability. If you buy a new phone, it means you're discarding an old one. If you buy a new couch, it means you're dumping an old one. Same with clothes, electrical appliances, daily use items in your house. Where do all of these old discarded products go? Nowhere. They pile up as waste. A lot of it as non-biodegradable waste. Or in the case of iPhones, digital waste. The strategy is employed across industries. In the world of fashion, it has been neatly packaged into what we call fast fashion, cheap clothes. Buy them, wear them, throw them. But the clothes do not disappear down a black hole. They too pile up. The practice, as I said, is followed across the board. But the tech giants are hands down industry leaders in planned obsolescence. Not only do they sabotage their phones, they reserve the right to repair them as well.
Have you ever seen the insides of a modern day device? It is way too complicated for most people and companies take advantage of this. They alone know how to repair their devices. They alone have the parts needed for this repair. This is where the right to repair movement comes in. It started in the United States, but it's slowly gaining currency all over the world. So what is this movement about? Time for another example. Suppose your phone's battery is, is fried. The circuit inside also needs fixing. So you go to the licensed seller and they give you an estimate. No surprises, it's more than half of your phone's price tag. Now imagine if the parts, tools and know-how to fix your phone was readily available. Not just to the company, but also independent repairmen. Imagine the amount of money you could have saved. This is the idea behind right to repair. But how do we achieve this? A lot lies in your hands, you the consumer. Consumers together have the power to demand more from producers. We just need to use that one magical word. That one word every company is scared of. Boycott. If we demand durability and right to repair from producers, they cannot resist for long. But don't get us wrong, we are not against upgrading, we are not against innovation either. All I'm saying is that our purchases should stem from our interest, not compulsion. And in a fair and just world, that's not asking for much. Our next report could prove to be a nightmare for Russia's adversaries. The Russians are building a bomb, another bomb, one that could trigger nuclear tsunamis. They could wipe out entire cities, leaving behind toxic radioactivity. It does sound unbelievable. But Russia has more futuristic weapons in its arsenal and it's working towards them. Take a look. Imagine this. A nuclear bomb traveling through the sea undetected. It explodes, setting off a chain of radioactive waves kicking off a tsunami that could sweep an entire city, leaving it uninhabitable for decades. This scenario is no longer just a figment of imagination. Russia is building this super weapon as we speak. It is called the Poseidon 2M39 torpedo. Reports say Russia is planning to carry out different tests of this missile this year. Russian President Vladimir Putin has asked for an update at key stages. At least three submarines tweaked to carry this torpedo are already undergoing tests in the Arctic. This is where Russia is said to be building a major military presence. The Arctic was once covered with ice, hence not navigable. But the melting ice now opens up a shipping route for Russia, one that could connect Europe to Asia. Reports say Putin wants to deploy the Poseidon in the Arctic by the summer of 2022. Advanced weapons are one way for major countries to exert power. And Russia isn't short on ideas. Putin is putting the weight of the Russian state behind futuristic weapons. One of them is the flying AK-47. A video had emerged in 2018. It shows the prototype of a flying gun. A report two years ago said that an arms maker had filed a patent for a drone equipped with a standard Kalashnikov rifle. But some believe this version of the weapon makes little sense. What about an unmanned tank? Russia has one. It is called the Uran 9. It's a tracked unmanned combat ground vehicle, which means Soldiers can fire guns and missiles from this tank without actually sitting inside it. The Uran 9 was first deployed during the Syrian civil war. It didn't work as intended, but it was inducted into military service in January 2019. However, the most publicized military advancement in Russia are the hypersonic missiles. The Russian military has two of them, the Avangard and the Kinzel. The Avangard is a nuclear-capable missile. It can travel at 20 times the speed of sound. The Kinzel, or the dagger in English, is faster. 
it can fly at 27 times the speed of sound. Last year in October, Russia had tested a new hypersonic missile. It was called the Zircon. It can destroy targets on both sea and land. The test firing of this missile was a great event, not just in the life of our armed forces, but for all of Russia. Equipping the army and navy with such new weapons, which have no equivalent worldwide, will without a doubt, in the long term, boost the defense capabilities of our state. Russia's biggest adversary, the United States, wants hypersonic missiles of its own. On Tuesday, the U.S. Air Force tried to test one near Los Angeles, but the missile failed to detach from the wing of the plane. The Kremlin must be having a good laugh about this one. Kyoto Report, Vion, World is One. With that, it's a wrap. We're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.